Thanks very much, Patricia. If I could call uh, Laszlo and Gunter on stage. So we're going to continue and I think this in, in some ways pick up or take further the discussions we just heard about the France roadmap. Uh, I think two heavyweights uh, with me from two dimensions. Um, Gunter Tallinger, you are the CEO of Allianz Investment Management, one of the largest uh, investors uh, in the world. And Laszlo Vero, you are the chief economist for the International Energy Agency, which um, uh, more than ever, I think, is so relevant to the investment in the financial community, not only, but particularly in terms of climate, and because energy is the, the largest source of emissions and the largest place where um, mitigation action is going to be taken. Um, and IEA, you, you at, the, uh, at the IEU play a very central role in providing the type of information on which um, the energy markets operate. Um, I, you know, I, I, I won't go, there are lots of statistics, lots of science that I can put out there. I don't think there's too many people in the room who are questioning the science. Um, I, a lot of it is about how do we act on it. Um, and I think we can all acknowledge that um, it's going to be difficult. Um, uh, there are very significant reductions that will be required. Um, and, you know, some of the areas we, we say now that uh, more than half the weather events um, assessed by the World Meteorological Organization in recent years s show some sort of anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic climate change signal that we can start to say that, well, that storm, was that because of climate change? Well, it's certain that climate change is, is contributing to the increased um, uh, number of, of uh, weather events, and that is having uh, an impact on many aspects of our economy. Um, depending how you look on it, um, uh, some statistics said recently that we currently have about a 1% chance of uh, getting onto a 1.5 trajectory and only 5% uh, of a 2 degree trajectory. Those are not very good odds for those who deal in the risk business. Um, and as we know, we're up to four and a half, uh, 405 parts per million which is unseen for the last three to five million years. Um, the Paris Agreement ultimately will require net zero decarbonization in the second half of this century. Some would say earlier than that. And um, that, that's uh, government to government commitments, but it's involving all aspects of our society and all our economies. So, um, Laszlo, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, the IEA, uh, first of all, we're going to focus our discussions about climate, but we're, we're going to talk about energy because um, we have uh, you as an energy specialist here, and I think we all acknowledge that that's the starting point, or that's a very important one of the sectors we're going to look at. Um, can you tell us, uh, IEA, you've just put out your uh, World Energy Outlook a couple weeks ago. Um, the statistics there are telling and also worrying, I think, in, in, in various uh, facets related to climate, but otherwise. So what is, can you tell us what is that analysis telling us in terms of the ability or the challenge of meeting the objectives of the Paris Agreement? So <coughs> to, to summarize our, our several hundred pages book uh, in, in one minute, uh, planet Earth uh, is right now in trouble uh, because everything that we have done so far, technological innovation, uh, energy policy, uh, policy, climate summits, emission trading systems, social movements, everything put together is sufficient to compensate for growing global population and global, uh, growing global GDP and essentially keep carbon dioxide emission, emissions almost stagnant with a slight increase. 2018 is going to be an increase in global carbon dioxide emissions, so was 2017 before that we had two or three years of stagnation. Uh, the, and if I look at the, the investment landscape, starting with the good news, there is now around uh, $300 billion annual investment flowing into renewable electricity. Now, that, when you run the numbers, that buys you enough wind power and enough solar panels for uh, equivalent to roughly 1% of global electricity consumption. So the windmills and the solar panels that we put in place, under normal weather conditions, they generate roughly 1% of global electricity. Now, under normal macroeconomic conditions, global electricity demand is growing at 2% per year. So with this, with this level of investment, you are never decarbonized uh, the system. You just run after demand growth. And then the second big question is that, of course, electricity is the biggest success story of clean energy. You know, wind power, solar power, these are power generating technologies. But electricity is only 20% of global final energy consumption. 
So you have to also invest in bringing the electricity, this, uh, the electricity in the other sectors. For example, the best known example is electric cars in the transportation sector. Now, as of today, if you again, if you run out, if you uh, look at the the speed of electrification of the transportation sector, the investment that was made in transport electrification, and this is primarily investment by governments, because when you look at the additional cost of an electric car, that's roughly as much as the budget subsidy that you get to your electric car. So it is not it is not the consumers who are investing in electric cars, it is the governments who invest in electric cars. And whether this is going to be sustainable from a fiscal point of policy point of view it remains to be seen. But all the electric cars that hit the, hit the road last year, they cut global oil, oil demand by around 30,000 barrels per day. Uh, last year, global oil demand grew by 1.5 million. Uh, in fact, our technology team has been increasingly optimistic about electric car technology, but our oil market team has been revising our oil numbers up rather than down, because the other drivers of global oil demand, uh, including trucks, aircraft, ships, are ex exceptionally robust. Uh, and last but not least, you have a third area in the heavy industry or long distance aviation shipping, which are not possible to electrify with the current technologies where you would need some out of the box uh, technological innovation. Uh, and we have seen last year, we have seen a slight ups uptick in the financial resources dedicated to clean energy innovation. Despite all the media stereotypes, this was actually driven by the United States. Uh, the, but this upswing came after a decade of stagnation. So the, the political rhetorics uh, about the importance of clean energy innovation has not been translated so far uh, to, uh, to, uh, to actual uh, innovation commitments. Uh, we definitely uh, hope that it would. Uh, so if you add everything together, uh, we, we think that, the, that under the current policy environment, we see an almost stagnating, very slightly increasing carbon dioxide emission pathway. But from a modern climate science point of view, whether you have stagnating carbon dioxide emissions instead of an increasing one, that's the difference of driving towards the cliff at full speed and taking your foot off the accelerator pedal, which is a really smart idea, but you are not yet breaking, uh, you are not yet breaking the car. Now, we also crunched the numbers for our well below two degrees Paris uh, stabilization, which is named the, the sustainable development scenario. And I should also add that in the sustainable development scenario, we also tackle energy poverty in Africa. So Africa is, is comprehensively electrified uh, with, with clean energy uh, in this scenario. And this is a, a technologically feasible scenario. And in fact, the total investment need in energy supply is comparable in the high carbon and the low carbon pathway. Uh, so the increasingly, climate change is a capital allocation problem. Due to the recent progress of low carbon technology, uh, the a low carbon pathway is no longer prohibitively expensive compared to a high carbon pathway. It has a comparable total investment need, but the structure of the investment is very different. In a low carbon pathway, we invest much more in energy efficiency and demand management, much more in low carbon supply, and much less in high carbon supply. And I should also add that I consider the topic of this conversation as the typical, uh, as, a, as a key crucial battlefield, because when you run the energy models assuming that same, that all technologies have the same access to finance and have the same discount rate, then the political assumptions that you have to take for a climate stabilization pathway are quite radical. Uh, so finance is actually a key battleground, they're a key enabling factor. One of the reason, one of the ways to do a politically feasible energy transition is to lower the cost of capital of low carbon technologies and increase the cost of capital of high carbon technologies. Thank you, Laszlo. And, and if I could try to break down, I would say the, the current predicament is you have scenarios that represent more or less the problem, which is as we're rushing towards the cliff. You also have scenarios, the well below two degrees trajectory, which sort of shows the solution. Now we have um, a lot of financiers and investors in the room. We just had a session on fiduciary duties. Um, and I guess one of the main questions is which scenarios are investors and other financial actors using to value investments going forward? At the IEA, do you have a good picture of how these scenarios are being used within the markets and what can be done to get um, investor A who uses the, the business as usual scenario to say, ah, no, I should be using the Paris Align scenario instead? Uh, well, first of all, I believe that the situation is improving. Uh, so large energy companies, large, large financial in institutions have an increasing awareness uh, to the climate change problem. 
uh, we have had uh, engagement with the finance sector, both with financial investors and also with financial regulators uh, in the context of the G20 financial stability program. And we believe that the way the sustainable development scenario is structured, that that can serve as the benchmark for the investment issues of the low carbon transition. Because, the, because it serves essentially as a bridge between the high level climate models developed by the IPCC and the corporate finance models used uh, for investment decisions. You need a bridge between these mm -hmm. two and the sustainable development scenario which crunches the numbers in a technology specific and regional specific fashion. So, so I can tell you that what is the investment level, of, uh, level into the electricity network in India in a low carbon pathway, we can answer uh, this type of questions on the basis of this analytical framework. This is well positioned uh, for this. Now, uh, uh, at the same time, I also see, see gaps. So, so there are still cases of, let's say, the CEO of the company has a very nice, very politically correct slide uh, on uh, sustainability, but then you crunch the numbers and the actual investment activity is not, not uh, consistent with that. That still happens mm. uh, quite, uh, quite often. And also, even in the, even in the clean sustainable investment uh, uh, initiatives, in my view, there is a, there's an almost exclusive focus into investing into wind and solar. Now, I, I do believe that wind and solar are going to be the backbones uh, of the new energy system, and we certainly have to scale up investment uh, in wind and solar. But uh, this exclusive focus, uh, in my view, neglects uh, three important areas which, where we need financial innovation, where we, we need new solutions from the, from the finance community. One is that we need to transform the electricity system uh, in order to incorporate wind and solar. We need a better electricity network, a more digitized, more flexible electricity network, and that requires a different investment approach. Then we need to electrify the end uses. And last but not least, we need, we need a plan B for the sectors which are not uh, directly electrifiable, let it be hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or any other uh, technological solution. And some of these approaches uh, you know, the, the investment models that have been used to ramp up investment in wind and solar uh, are difficult to copy paste with other technology areas. So we see a very important role in, in financial innovation. And let me tell you that we have, we have a new initiative with major development banks on developing methodologies to ramp up investment in energy efficiency and demand management, because that is a key area, but that's also, a, uh, that's also an area which is quite challenging to finance. Excellent. Thank you very much, Laszlo. So let, let's move from defining where we need to go and, and some of the problems, I think, in terms of the, the models we're using and how we need to shift over to an investor who is um, quite aggressive, I guess, progressive on this issue. Um, Alliance has been out front um, in various ways, I think, in, in um, both um, understanding some of the challenges from the insurance perspective, the risk perspective, but also starting to invest in the solutions. So, Gunter, can you speak for where do you see the key avenues through which investors can start to take serious climate action, and how much of that action are we actually seeing today? Yeah, well, um, I do believe the, uh, let's say, the real serious uh, e action is uh, e once an investor starts to really, or an asset owner really starts to consider a portfolio holistically. We have heard that in the prior panel, the whole thing is uh, perhaps ESG. ESG is just a nice acronym that we can use, uh, and, and let's just continue with that one. But obviously, it's not only E. It must be the S and the G. It's super important, and I can explain in a minute uh, why by giving uh, a more, let's say, human answer to your question. Now, in terms of what's happening there, we have, of course, many investors who are out there and consider um, ESG with a very, very uh, big emphasis on the E part. Uh, e then, of course, come up and have discussions about just transition and uh, e similar things. You also heard it in the prior panel, um, which is very, very good. Um, then we have many investors who say, okay, look, there are these so-called green assets, uh, all forms, uh, green bonds, whatever there is. This is also very good, but absolutely not sufficient. There is no point if you have uh, something like 3% of your assets into green um, assets. The, the whole portfolio must go in the direction of sustainability. And for that, an approach is needed quite clearly that gives an understanding what is sustainability. 
And obviously, everybody can uh, ha have, uh, let's say, certain approaches uh, and develop and define uh, her own approach. Uh, he, this is certainly very good. If it comes to E, then there are things out uh, like, for instance, uh, the science-based target initiative or other uh, climate resilient paths uh, that can be defined. By the way, one can then say, okay, this goes towards a net zero 2050. We can then have many discussions whether that is actually actionable already today or not. That's not so much the point. The point is to have these paths um, defined and start to work on those paths for, as I said, the entire portfolio. Now, you may struggle with this entire portfolio thing. Um, if I may come to my, uh, let's say, other form of answering the question, uh, many of us here would call uh, him or herself a representative of the financial industry, uh, no doubt. I have uh, a proposal of what we can call ourselves, for sure, everybody here, uh, which is we are representatives, uh, obviously, of uh, humankind. The moment you start to think about sustainability from that angle, there is not so much of a discussion whether you consider the entire portfolio or only a part of it. You immediately say, okay, if this is what we actually want to achieve, then clearly, yes, we are in the financial industry. We transfer this, our understanding, what we need to do for an evolution of uh, humankind into our world. And then, yes, of course, you need to consider the entire portfolio for sustainability reasons. And yes, of course, you are not going to consider it only for the E part, but also for the S and the G. So, Gunter, can I start to dig more into what you're saying? So, if we take the humankind perspective, what do you expect or what do you think the global investment community can do in terms of upping their, their game? Because what you're saying, obviously, is we can't just focus very simply on our own business. It's also the contribution to society at large. But at the end of the day, our own business still need to, to prosper. Um, so what do you see as how do we drive real measurable decarbonization impact in the economy? So may, may I quickly uh, come to this prosper point? Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you read, for instance, a, a, a report uh, of the Energy Transition Commission, uh, it's led by uh, Mr. Turner. Some of us uh, know who Mr. Turner is, if they know what the Financial uh, let's say Services Authority uh, in uh, the UK is. Um, he is leading that commission, and that commission comes up with a report saying, okay, we have uh, roughly 0.5 of global GDP as a cost if we want to think about 2050 net zero. Yeah. So there seems to be actually something that economically fits. Uh, that's about the prosper part. Um, he, he, so it goes in that direction. Another element to the prosper part is once an investor or an asset owner starts to understand the risks of ES and G, I, uh, I clearly uh, am of the opinion that you have a completely different form of risk return uh, understanding and that very, very much goes in the direction of prosper. Now, what can um, investors do? Uh, as I said, it's very important to have an understanding what is sustainability for the entire portfolio. But let's assume that understanding is out there. Then one very, very quickly learns that just a pure assessment of the individual uh, assets in a portfolio are not sufficient. You actually need to work with those assets. You need to start an engagement with those parts of your portfolio that are not performing in the sustainability uh, sense well. That engagement is actually something that requires quite some capacity in terms of uh, e skills, but also simply time that experts can invest into these uh, e considerations and into this communication with those assets. Now, if you get into this, then you very soon learn that you actually need to link up with other asset owners, because otherwise you are just, uh, let's say, kind of crying wolf out there. You need to have several of them who start to argue with certain of these assets, be these uh, corporations, how they actually may change. And then the expertise needs to come in. That's why, uh, let's say, asset owners like us are quite happy to have something like, uh, let's say, the Energy Transition Commission coming up with these reports. And very, very happy, of course, uh, let's say, with the International Ag uh, Energy Agency to come up with these scenarios because they help us to communicate what actually could be achieved in what framework. So how, w how would you make your alignment measurable? What sort of targets would you be giving to the companies that you are in in invested in? One, th one thing is uh, we, we ourselves, and this is really only uh, one example, we committed to the science-based target initiative as a company. 
but we actually are now working with the colleagues of SPTI to uh, bring up the SPTI commitment for our entire portfolio. That means we actually require something that is comparable or is a science-based target and a path. That's what we actually expect uh, from our assets. Mm. And that's the discussion that we need to have with obviously exactly the shortcomings that Laszlo uh, mentioned. So there might be industries that, uh, that are struggling to see this, but we need to work together with them to actually lead it in that direction. Thank you very much, Gunter. So back to you, Laszlo, how do you see that um, the decarbonization scenarios at hand, are they where you want them to be? Essentially, you say we have a target and this is what the scenario is, or is there more work to be done, I think, in terms of the relationship between the scenario builders and the investment community to say how can we get the most responsible type of engagement towards moving towards a pathway um, and also sending the signals is what you talk about. It's hard for investors individually to do it on their own, but if they have the, the means in which to basically provide the, the overall signaling, including which scenarios they expect corporates to be using as they plan investments forward. Um, do you see from the IEA perspective that work needs to be done to move towards that sort of universe? Yes, uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, there, there's a great scope and a great potential to integrate uh, our work on a sustainable development scenario with uh, uh, financial and corporate, uh, in, uh, corporate investment analysis, focusing on the 95%, because the, the energy sector is around 5% of global stock market capitalization, mm -hmm. and in the energy sector, it's, it's, you have reasonably straightforward questions and answers, but uh, uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, you have the 95% of the rest of the economy which determines energy demand and which determines energy pathways. Uh, and there, uh, uh, there, there are still very, se very serious, very, uh, very serious blind spots. Uh, you know, one third of global carbon dioxide emissions are coming from the heavy industry. Now you can have companies who very proudly explain that they are a sustainable company because the, the electricity consumption of their headquarters is coming from mm -hmm. wind and solar power, but the steel, the glass, the cement from which the headquarters is built was produced by coal with massive carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, we, don't, uh, you know, we, we don't have a, something like a premium market for sustainable steel. Uh, the, uh, so we need to broaden our horizon to the value chain. Uh, a, lo a, lot of the, a lot of the companies that investors invest in either equity or debt, uh, they have global supply chains, uh, and a lot of the carbon dioxide emission is uh, in the supply chain itself, uh, where, where, where again they have to look at. And for, uh, last but not least, any credible climate pathway, and I should emphasize that of course climate science is very complex, but we should not let uh, the complexity of climate science stand in the way of taking real action, because any credible climate pathway shares two important characteristics. One is that you achieve a global peak of carbon dioxide emissions essentially tomorrow morning, and already by 2030, you have a several billion tons uh, reduction in carbon dioxide emissions, which, which means that you have to work with already existing technologies and already existing infrastructure. And sometimes mid-century, 2050, 2060, 2070, you go to net zero emissions, and I'm not talking about just cutting emissions a bit, but flying to Australia without carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and for that, you need some radically different business models and radically different technologies. And I should emphasize that these two are not strategic alternatives of each other. This is something which has to be done simultaneously. And just to tell you one concrete example, the in, in our well below two degrees pathway, it's not simply that we have much more electric cars. Altogether, the number of cars is 500 billion less than in the high carbon pathway because the equivalent of 500 billion cars uh, is replaced by shared mobility, uh, urban mass transit, a different bicycle-friendly urban design. So there's a very important systemic change. Uh, and the, and I, think, I think we need to look at companies like the IT industry is expanding its R&D and innovation on self-driving technology and, and e-business deliveries in a very significant fashion. Our analysis suggests that e-business uh, and delivery-based business models can be very good for the climate or a climate disaster, depending on how it is organized and depending on whether the, uh, whether the sustainability aspect is incorporated uh, into, the, into the digital model. So I believe that this, this problem is, is broader than the problem of invest in a solar panel instead of a coal mine. Uh, it's, uh, and I, I, and uh, we will be very happy to work uh, with the investor community on, on deepening this. 
Thank you very much, Leslie. Well, I want to, in terms of a closing question, um, Gunter, as, as Leslie, you're talking about the need to broaden the industries that we're working with. Um, in terms of the value chain and the, the ecosystem in the financial services, there are a lot of other actors that are out there. And I know within the fiduciary duty work, there's part of a view which is the legal in interpretations are reasonably well agreed, certainly in certain contexts, but then you have a very complicated value chain of financial advisors and consultants and not everybody's on board. What do you think of where we are in the ecosystem? And I would pr particularly point out the accountants, the accounting standards, the, the, the courts, um, in terms of litigation, do you think that um, some aspects of the ecosystem have fallen behind and need to do more to catch up for, the, for an investor like Allianz to actually deliver on what you're targeting to do? Well, I would say that, uh, let's say, many areas are clearly evolving. If it comes, for instance, to reporting, we clearly have at the DCFD, we have an understanding how reporting actually should look like. We are in the midst of implementing. Yeah, mm -hmm. Several already have made the step. Others have to follow, so that would be a little bit the accounting mm -hmm. uh, world. Um, in, in terms of uh, legal, th th this is very difficult to answer because I'm not sure whether, uh, let's say, we really can follow through by using legal means. Mm -hmm. there's, there's lots of commitment that needs to come from us on the financial uh, inside, but also from the uh, company, the corporation, the asset side. Uh, legally, this is perhaps not enforceable mm -hmm. uh, uh, up to a certain level. If we were to reach such a world where we all of a sudden have to legally enforce that companies uh, need to become sustainable, I fear we are far, far away from, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, net zero by 2050, far, far away. Yeah. Certainly in terms of markets, some would say in the U.S. you don't get serious action until the courts get involved. Um, I think to some extent, yes, that's true. I think you're right, though, at the same time, we can't only rely on them. It's like we also can't only rely on policymakers. I think we can't only rely on any one part of the ecosystem, the bottom economic system. Um, unfortunately, what we need to do, or fortunately, is we need to work together, mm -hmm. and we need a ratcheting function. And I think that the actions of investors play a very important role, and others in the, in the financial system, in basically saying there are real risks here, there are real opportunities, we're acting on them, or we're taking a, a holistic or a, a wide portfolio-wide approach, um, but we can't do it alone. We also are going to need, governments are going to have to ratchet up, um, and consumers and others are going to have to also be evolving. And, and local context is always going to be slightly different. We have the, the developing, developed, emerging markets context, which will all be slightly different. But I think holistically, um, if we can get the actors to be doing virtually up-targeting reinforcement rather than the race to the bottom, then we have some likelihood or some potential to start to address this problem. If we don't, the numbers that uh, Laszlo and team are putting out are going to continually show that we're actually driving um, at whatever speed towards a cliff, and uh, we're definitely heading in the right direction, wrong direction, excuse me. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much, the two of you, and uh, this is um, in many ways uh, a topic that's going to just continue, and hopefully at speed, but at speed in the right direction. Thank you.